music is Leonard Cohen. Mike takes you down to a place by the centrifuges. It's your first day in the lab and you don't know what a centrifuge is and he hands you precious flags and you drop them and they shatter and you look at him quite meekly but he says it doesn't matter they were only the control <laughs> and he gives you of his buffer and he gives you of his strains and you wish you had his genome <laughs> or at least you had his brain I came to him one morning, an idea had been forming. My transformants weren't transforming, and my swarmers were not swarming. I said, Mike, I'm a failure. I want to work at Lord and Taylor. I think I'm quitting science, but he says, now don't be hasty. You see, science, like the food at our science cafeteria, is sometimes nasty, sometimes tasty. <laughs> And he soothes you so discreetly, and you trust in him completely, and your mind, it has been freed, and you know that somewhere, something will succeed. Now Mike is packing his papers in a folder, there's a knapsack on his shoulder, his pipette is in a holder, and as he leaves the floor, the shakers all stop shaking, the columns all run dry, and the autoclave stops baking, it'll never be the same. And you know that you must keep him, or at least that you must clone him, and you know that you will miss him, and you know that you will phone him all the time. <laughs>
Every scientist knows words like atom. I'm envisioning a science where every scientist knows words like active listening, which is somebody comes with a problem and you don't give them advice. You first listen to their feelings, their needs, and find a solution that addresses everybody's needs. That's a basic word in many fields. This sounds very far from where science is right now. But vision is like a compass that points us in a certain direction. It will suggest very specific ways that are happening right now in science to change it. So uh, this language, uh, just talking about something, puts a spotlight on it. And I just want to share with you one uh, word that's been very helpful for me as a mentor for students doing science. It has to, be, to do with the mental schema of research. That is to say, you know, the human being going uh, trying to do something has a schema of how he, he she thinks it will turn out. And that schema is very important because if things are different from the schema, you experience extra stress. And if you read scientific papers and textbooks, you're prone to believing that this is the schema of research, and this is something quite common in science. This is the problem, this is the solution, and this is research. <laughs> that means a certainty. Now, if something goes wrong, if experiments don't work, or your student gets depressed, that's perceived as a cognitive dissonance. Something to be eradicated and on to the next solution. But people who are in science recognize that you can adopt a different schema, which is more realistic. And that's the following. This is the problem, and this is the solution. You start going, research doesn't work. Experiments don't work. <laughs> At some point, you reach a place where your <coughs> basic assumptions are broken down. And it doesn't work. And this is linked with negative emotions. And we call this phase, in my lab, the cloud. It seems to stand at the boundary between the known and the unknown, guarding the boundary. Why is that? Because to go into the unknown and discover something new, something, at least one of your first assumptions has to change. If you don't go through a cloud, you don't go through a cloud when you're cooking by a recipe, let's say, going from the known to the known. Going to the unknown has built into it the cloud. And that, therefore, science is a kind of a hero's journey, you can say, going into the unknown and bringing back something useful. So you have to again and again to fight the cloud. Now, as a graduate student, of course, I wasn't told about this fact. And when I got into the cloud the first time, I, was, I got so depressed that I decided I couldn't come back to the university. I'm not worthy of stepping into the university. And I recovered somehow with my relationships and support. And the second time, and succeeded, the second time I got into the cloud, I said, oh, maybe there's a pattern here. Maybe it's not me. And now I teach this because, in fact, if you know about the cloud, at least you don't feel that something's wrong with you. It's something about the craft. It's actually, you learn to love the cloud because it's a signal that you're going to the unknown. It's a, it's a signal that you're about to make a discovery, but I can't tell you how long it will take. The mentor's role in this uh, phase is to give emotional support. Why? Because research shows very clearly that when, when you're trying to solve a creative task, and you're under stress and fear, your performance goes very, very way down because the mind stops looking in unexpected, risky directions. In order to solve creative problems, it's good to have a safe, supported environment of positive regard. So if we want to do better science, we better understand this part of the craft. Not only understand, but teach it as kind of the basic starting point. Then, and if it's somehow you notice inside the cloud, a, a new solution, C. Something different than what you set out to do, and experiments don't work, etc. Then you publish a paper, A, R, O, C, which is a good way to write papers, as long as you distinguish it from the process of doing science. 